Um, Let's see. Okay. Uh, Mike mentioned we we do have a a, a new I ask fellow too. Uh, we supported uh, projects. These are the projects that received money um, in 2019, and so we'll have some brief reports on these. You'll see the two events uh, have been uh, postponed uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Uh, so the money will will go forward with those. Next slide, Jackie. Um, there's a couple of other projects that we also supported that have gone uh, forward. One of the events this weekend, for example, is the gender and polar research. Uh, it's now going to be online um, uh, for one for four hours, uh, I believe, on Monday now. So this slide's out of date. I got to fix that. Um, and they're asking for a little bit more money to uh, to have a. Uh, but anyway, there are reports available on all of these as to what. Uh, how this money was spent uh, supporting in, in a lot of cases early career um, scientists and uh, indigenous knowledge holders to come to meetings and and contribute to that so the next slide jackie um, <clears throat> these are some other activities uh, we have been involved with as a marine working group i've served on an action group for indigenous involvement trying to improve what i ask does uh, in terms of uh, bringing indigenous uh, um, uh, communities uh, it better into, and we've got a, a report that's been made um, to uh, the IAS Council, will be presented at the IAS Council meeting. Uh, national reports were submitted for all 24 uh, countries participating in IAS that have been summarized. Um, uh, I've also served on a program advisory committee for an Arctic regional workshop that's been postponed due to the COVID-19 um, uh, and we've we've sent I ask fellows to several meetings that are Arctic Council, and we've got a couple of new uh, proposed activities that are just uh, uh, to us at the Marine Working Group. Next slide. Um, and the and these are some other activities that we're going to talk about uh, that are on the agenda right now. Is that okay. the last slide? I think. Yeah. Oh, and then this is uh, these are all of the the, the main the meat of the uh, meeting will be trying to trying to figure out how to spend uh, the money, and these are the proposals before us for uh, cross-cutting. So cross-cutting proposals to IASC are ones that involve more than uh, one working group. Uh, okay. Questions, comments? Hello? Did we lose them? Hello? Here. We can hear you. Okay, perfect, perfect. So if there's a, maybe what we'll do, if a quick question and then we'll go on to, uh, mine is just gonna be a verbal update. Lee, do you have any, any questions for Lee? No. Okay, then I'm gonna go ahead. The, the next thing is just an update. Oh, hey, hi, Brandon, I see your face. Um, that uh, we have the Pacific Arctic Group meeting. Uh, there's uh, information on the agenda but there's also, I'll be sending out a link, the Zoom uh, connection is on the uh, uh, Arctic Science Summit Week link that's on the ag agenda there, so you can access that. Same thing with the Synoptic Arctic Survey. Both of them will occur on March 30th. The Pacific Arctic Group is an association of six countries, Japan, Japan, China, Korea, Russia, Canada, and the US, but everybody is invited to the call. We're briefing it down to about a two hour call and it starts at 0000 uh, GMT time. And then the second is the Synoptic Arctic Survey. I'll be speaking about that later uh, in this call, but that one is at 1200 UTC time on March 30th. That's, uh, so I'm not gonna say anything further about that. And then I think we can open it up now. Um, I don't have the agenda in front of me. Uh, you can remind me there, uh, Meredith. I think those are the updates that I put in there, but if there's anybody on the call, that wants to add updates, please say so now. We we also had Chelsea giving. Oh, excuse uh, me. Oh, Chelsea, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, <laughs> you're up. Okay, um, so I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, I'm just giving you guys a quick introduction to. Hang on, sorry. Um, all right, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was going to give uh, you all a quick introduction to a new self-forming team we have on IARPIC, which is the Early Career Forum. Um, and so, as you can see on the slide, we are hoping to just 
create a, a collaboration space for uh, the early career community that either already exists with IARBIC or so that we can reach out and try to expand that further to encourage sharing of information, updates, job opportunities, collaboration opportunities, um, all the things like that. So currently the team leaders for this group um, are myself, um, apologies, I didn't really introduce myself. I'm um, Chelsea Wagner-Cope. I'm at the University of Maryland. I actually work with uh, Lee Cooper and Jackie Grimmeyer. Um, and then we also have um, Chelsea Aho, who's a U.S. Forest Service, Alex Tate at the Anchorage Museum, and Angela Bliss at Oregon State University. Um, myself and Alex are uh, board members on uh, U.S. Apex. Um, so this is the U.S. National Committee for the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists. Um, and so this network that we have in the U.S. Um, has more than 400 members currently. And the way that this works primarily is just through email announcements and uh, passing things along primarily through our Twitter account. And anytime that there's bigger conferences that we know there's going to be a strong polar contingent at, we try to coordinate some sort of meetup uh, or early career panel. And we consistently plan something for AGU every year, uh, but try to expand it to other conferences. Um, but one thing that this this need that was identified that came up um, among some U.S. APEX discussions was that, uh, you know, with, with these 400 members that we have that are distributed widely throughout the U.S. and that in some places there's, you may be the only um, polar person within your state or within a pretty far distance. So we wanted to find a better way to try and connect more people. Um, and we also were reached out to by some of uh, some people who were not early career that wanted to find a way that they said they wished that there was some sort of mechanism like a yearbook almost that you could flip through and find who was early career and how can you reach in and tap, tap into that network. And so the platform that IARBIC already offered seemed like a really good opportunity for USA PACS and IARBIC to work together to uh, showcase who this network is and make it a resource that people could access. Um, so the purpose of this group is really just for anybody that identifies as early career. We don't discriminate. Uh, so it's however you feel. If you want to join, you're welcome to do so. Um, we, so we're encouraging any early career, but we're also anybody that doesn't. If you want to just be um, a little more up to date with what's happening in those posts, you're welcome to join as well. Um, but we're hoping to use this space for people to share these opportunities and announcements, um, similar to like what Lee was just mentioning, how there's oftentimes uh, funding support to bring early career participants to certain meetings or workshops. Um, so this might be a good resource for those to reach out to us and say, hey, can you uh, let everyone know we're looking, we're advertising for this opportunity. Um, and so the way that we envision using this space, um, is to not only just to, to show who exists in this network, but we also want to encourage early career participation in some of these IARPIC meetings, uh, get them to join collaboration teams and get more involved. Um, as I said, we are wanting to share opportunities. Uh, another idea that we're hoping to do is highlight uh, research among the early career community. So uh, if we're gonna look to find ways to uh, highlight early career publications to the IRBIT community, and then also we can um, uh, highlight that information uh, through the US APEX channels as well. So, and that also includes any data sets or reports that might be of interest. Um, we also want to use this space for uh, potential collaborations. Ideally, if you are running a, a collaboration team meeting and you want to have an early career presentation. It's a good way to reach out to us and, and find someone that could do that for you. Um, yeah, so that's basically the gist of it. We're, um, we're here, and so what we're asking you to do is, I know I think there's a couple early career people on this call. I hope that you all consider joining, and those of you that you are not, if you would be willing to pass this along to any postdocs or graduate students or colleagues that you know that might be interested in and utilizing this resource. And we've already had a lot of active posting going on and people tagging us and letting us know that there's opportunities available. So we wanna keep that up. And we're also working with Meredith to find other ways and brainstorm of how we can also um, 
leverage this relationship between the early career community and IARPIC and how we can get uh, more early career participation involved in some of IARPIC's activities. So um, if you have any questions or want to advertise anything, feel free to reach out to me or any other of the team leaders or just go ahead and post in our early career forum. We appreciate it. All right. Yay. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, if you want to de-share and then does any, does anybody have any questions for Chelsea? I do. So if um, if somebody's interested in this, would they search for that 4390 or early career? How do they find this once they're on IRP? Yep, I can answer so, that. So okay, Catherine, yeah, go ahead. put the link in the chat. Um, it says here I their team page, but it's supposed to say here is their team page. And um, from there, you should be able to join. It's also to find it on the IARPIC website, you go, there's a like a bar at the top and it's under teams and you scroll down to self-forming teams and the early career forum is there. Great. And I would also notice on the chat box, this is Jackie again, that uh, uh, the agenda for uh, uh, Olivia Lee uh, put the agenda for the Arctic Observing Summit. So it's right there. Uh, as well as what uh, the one I, the generic one I have on the agenda. So are there any other more questions or updates that people want to provide? Going, going. Okay, Jackie, I'll take you up on it and say that um, IARPIC is having a community meeting on, um, I think it's the 29th, uh, so of ASSW um, from 4 to 5.30 in Iceland time and the meeting, the intent of the meeting is to um, gather people together, like the international community together to discuss uh, how, what should be included in the next uh, five-year Arctic research plan and also to describe some of the diversity and inclusion activities that IARPIC has been supporting and um that is on the program in great the mm -hmm. great area and the zoom connection as i mentioned are all available on the arctic science summit week online agenda as of today okay so jackie this is molly yay molly hi sorry for joining a little late but um the environmental intelligence collaboration team and um, Renee Crane's logistics, Arctic logistics meeting was going to be April 15th. We're now changing that to, I think it's April 20th, um, Kelly. Um, there was a conflict on April 15th. And the, go the goal of that meeting has been similar to ones we've had in the past where we get all the research crews folks together to talk about plans, especially in the bearing uh, Northern Bering, Southern Chukchi, kind of what are the plans, uh, what to do, maybe some enhanced um, testing for harmful algal blooms, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this may be a um, just a meeting of what are we doing instead of cruises this year. So um, we'll be sending out more information, but that um, meeting has been changed from April 15th to the following week. Just wanted to let folks know. And you'll be hey, Molly. Okay. This is Sarah. It's April 22nd from 3 to 4 Eastern time. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't remember which date we ended up with. <laughs> It'll be up on the website shortly. Thanks. Great. Okay. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Molly and Sarah. Are there any other comments or updates? And if you think of them, you can always, during the rest of the, the webinar, you could always add them into that everything chat box because that helps provide the minutes too that uh, Meredith is putting together. Okay. So at this point, um, I would like to have uh, our first speaker, which is going to be Franz Muter, and he's going to speak about recent fishery studies uh, with a focus on Arctic cod. And so I think, uh, Franz, I think you're going to share your screen, correct? Uh, yeah, well, and I just turned on my video too, um, just so it's a little more personal, but if, uh, if the presentation starts getting too pixelated or whatever because of bandwidth considerations, just let me know and I will um, turn that off. Um, Great, uh, thank you. Can, uh, can anybody see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so Jackie had asked me in part to kind of um, originally to talk about uh, some recent under ice sampling work to, to show what we did next last November and then also if I could talk more broadly about fisheries issues because Bob 
Foyt uh, from NOAA couldn't make it. So uh, I just put together a, a few kind of uh, high level um, uh, slides of, uh, of some of the, the ongoing work with contributions from a number of people here, including the Go West team that I'll uh, introduce later. Um, and funding for a lot of this fisheries work was uh, provided by a number of different organizations, including the ones um, listed here. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll start with just the basic fisheries service in the Bering Sea, for those of you not familiar with it. And the basic story coming out of that in recent years is just the increasing uh, borealization of the northern Bering Sea fish community, which just means uh, southern species moving into the northern Bering Sea. And um, on the left here is the standard Bering Sea surveys that have been done on an annual basis since 1982 in the southern part of the Bering Sea by NOAA. And then in uh, some of the recent years, 2010, 2017 through 2019, they've been extended to the northern Bering Sea, which has, you know, because uh, fish were presumably starting to shift into that region. And then, uh, and this is was a large commercial, large mesh bottom trawl survey, uh, uh, bottom trawl to do these surveys. And in the Chukchi Sea, there's really only been one of those. That was in 2012 as part of the Arctic uh, Ecosystem Integrated Survey. Um, broadly speaking, um, I don't want to give a false impression of fisheries resources in the Chukchi Sea. Um, if you look at sort of a broad gradient uh, south to north, um, this is uh, kind of the density of all fish combined from the south on the left to the north on the right, and that's on a log scale. So it's you know two orders of magnitude decrease as you go from the from the um, Alaska Peninsula here uh, uh, to the northern part of the Chukchi Sea, and of course the commercial fisheries are all in this area in the southeast Bering Sea, um, and then uh, fish density is dropping. Uh, quite substantially after that. This is um, averaged over these years here, or in some cases only one year, that all reflect uh, sort of relatively cold years. And in warmer years, we know things kind of um, shift north. And you know, in particular, if you look at just pick just one species that I'm sure you've all seen the, the maps of that, but uh, I wanted to illustrate that in terms of the changes in density um, so these are densities for three different survey years where we actually had surveys in the northern Bering Sea from the Alaska Peninsula in the south here on the left to Bering Strait um, on the right. And in the colder year 2010, the first time that northern Bering Sea survey was done, that you know matches the trend that I showed earlier uh, of uh, higher high densities in the south and low densities in the north. In 2017, the next survey that covered the Northern Bering Sea that kind of flattened out. And then in 2018, you see much higher densities actually in the Northern Bering Sea. We see the same pattern for walleye pollock, basically also kind of this reversal. So fairly massive redistribution of large predatory fish to the north that are bound to have pretty um, important kind of ecosystem level effects because a particular Pacific cod is a you know benthic predator. Um, of course these fish didn't stop at Bering Strait most likely. Um, in the Chukchi Sea we don't really have any other large mesh surveys to look for um, for large fish but the Russians have done surveys in 2018 and 2019 and found fairly substantial densities of walleye pollock in the um, Russian uh, western part of the uh, southwestern part of the Chukchi Sea, at least. Uh, so, switching to the Chukchi Sea, um, there have been a whole variety of different fishery surveys, but with different gear, with a small mesh beam trawl. Um, and mostly those have been used to kind of look, identify the, the different assemblages, look at species diversity, look at spatial pattern for individual species. Look at life history distribution and abundance of Arctic cod in particular, and I'll focus more on that in a minute here. Uh, but these survey surveys currently provide a pretty limited capacity to um, document any changes in you know either distribution, abundance, or diversity of fishes. And so um, that was, you know, of course, part one of the ideas behind um, one of the surveys that I'll talk about in a, in a minute here. But this is kind of what's available. And there's a slide that Jen Marsh put together recently. Um, she's been um, getting some support from BOEM uh, as a postdoc to look at 
essential fish habitat for um, Arctic cod, uh, saffron cod, and snow crab in this region. And she compiled all the available cruises um, that use uh, it's a patchwork of you know different types of cruises for different purposes and um, and so uh, these these don't provide you know consistent time series by any means um, even though they span 2004 through 2017 here in this case um, uh, I do want to point out this includes the Rizalka cruises um, this does not show the, the um, samples that were taken as part of Rizalka on the Russian side there's only the US EEZ uh, just to pick up one of those surveys, um, highlight one of the surveys led by Katrin Eichen, the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, um, with the idea of kind of monitoring changes in biodiversity in that region, and uh, from a uh, you know fisheries perspective, that uh, they we used the small mesh um, trawl on those surveys. This shows the station grid in 2017. This line here was not sampled in 2015. Um, as far as the fish community goes, one of the outcomes from that was for the two years that the survey was done, uh, hopefully to be continued in some fashion um, in the future. Um, but uh, uh, this, this does include, I want to point out, some of the DBO lines. Um, and so there's been an increasing effort, you know, thanks to Jackie and others, to add fisheries type sampling to the DBO lines. Uh, for this, for these two surveys, um, 2015 being a somewhat cooler year, 2017 being a warmer year, there's been, there was a much higher species diversity in general in 2017. So for any amount of effort, this is just the number of stations sampled, you know, for a given number of stations sampled, you get between five and eight more species in uh, 2017 than in 2015. And that reflected an increase in Pacific origin species in that year, um, but they were generally still uh, only at very low abundances and you know the smaller species. Um, uh, looking just at Arctic cod too, there was also a difference in Arctic cod with higher abundances in Arctic cod in 2017. And so I mentioned Arctic cod a few times, and I do want to talk about a little bit more about Arctic cod just because. Um, that is uh, one of the key species in that region. They do love um, uh, ice as well, but they uh, occur kind of throughout the water column. They are a pretty key uh, link, central link in the Arctic marine food web, um, connecting uh, both ice algae and phytoplankton via zooplankton, particularly some of the calanus. Uh, to um, a variety of predators, including seabirds that feed on the juveniles. Uh, including uh, seals, different seal species, beluga whales, and ultimately um, polar bears and, and humans. Um, you know, just an example, uh, ringed seals and bearded seals, you know, a, a large portion of their stomachs contain um, Arctic cod over that, uh, that time period here. And there's some indication that that has increased over time. Um, just a little bit about their general um, life history. They, they do occur on the bottom um, as adults, particularly on the shelf, um, on the slope, um, in throughout, and throughout the water column. They often ice associated. Um, they mature uh, fairly young for a gadget or for any fish species at, at two, uh, two to three years. Uh, they don't get much longer than about 25 inches, uh, usually quite a bit smaller in our region. Maximum age is also pretty low, about eight years compared to other gadgets. Um, they are uh, uh, very adapted to living in the Arctic. Um, they have big eyes, are adapted to feeding in low light conditions, and they have antifreeze to deal with cold temperatures. Um, so focusing uh, again on the Chukchi Sea here, also this just shows the overall distribution. They are a, a pan-Arctic circumpolar species occur pretty much wherever there is ice cover in the winter and beyond. Um, but focusing back on the Chukchi Sea, one of the things, and many of you have seen this, one of the things we've learned over a number of surveys that um, used an acoustic trawl survey uh, sampling in the uh, Chukchi Sea as well as in the Northern Bering Sea during the first two Arctic ice years, um, uh, that uh, that there have been these consistent, very high dense aggregations of Arctic cod in the 
uh, Northeast Chuck GC um, was quite a bit of interannual variability, in particular this uh, uh, year in 2017, the, the warmest year here where temperatures in this region were quite warm, uh, uh, where the densities were, were uh, In 2013, we had very high, extremely high densities, and then they got even higher in 2017. Um, so these are uh, juvenile Arctic cod, mostly between about two and five centimeters. Um, great food for some of the seabirds. Um, uh, but we don't really know where they're coming from, where they're spawning. We don't really know where they're going after we sample them in the summer. Um, so those are sort of the two big outstanding questions for Arctic cod. Um, Kathleen Westfalls did some modeling of trying to figure out where they might be coming from using an uh, individual-based model driven by a, by um, a, a, a ROMS model that was originally developed um, through through BOEM funding by Enrique Kurtzer and now um, uh, Seth and Seth Danielson and uh, <coughs> um, Kate Hedstrom kind of maintain that and. What Kathleen found was basically the most plausible origin of these uh, Arctic cod that we sample in this part of the Chukchi Sea is probably around the Chukotka Peninsula, uh, south of Bering Strait as well, on the Russian side, maybe as far south as Anadir. Um, and, um, and that if they spawn here uh, in the, the winter time, that gets them to this area where we sample them, uh, or at least can get them to that area where we sample them in, in late summer. And, and also um, they, you know, about the right size, although the model says they're a little smaller when they get there. Um, so that, that's a likely, um, you know, source of where they're coming from, where some of the spawning will likely take place. We don't know where they go after that, um, and so one of the questions was, you know, do they continue going with sort of the coastal current around the corner in the Beaufort Sea onto the slope regions or into the basin? Uh, so what is that connection kind of to the Central Arctic Ocean? Because there really hasn't been um, any sampling to speak of in that part of the um, uh, Central Basin or along the slope with few exceptions. And that was the motivation for going out um, in the fall uh, to sample, uh, Arctic, uh, try to sample Arctic cod under the ice to see if they actually associate with the ice. And that was a collaboration with a number of European colleagues. Um, we had gotten this under ice net that I'll, I'll show in a minute to sample under the ice. Um, and uh, this was made possible through a rice funding um, uh, who provided uh, seven ship days, and then um, we were able to partner up with Jim Thompson's CODA project to go out and uh, and sample in that region. Uh, the primary goal for us was really to just develop capacity for under ice sampling in the Pacific Arctic to see if we can use this net off the Sekuliak and to make it work to sample under the ice. Uh, from a science perspective, our key um, question was, what's the role of the newly formed sea ice as habitat for, uh, for both plankton and Arctic cod in the late fall? And so we went in November last year um, and uh, sampled off the Sekuliak. You can see the net being towed behind the Sekuliak here, and I'll show a few other pictures of the, how, that, how that works. Um, we were able to sample a total of 11 stations where we deployed the suit. One of those, 006 here, was in open water. All the others here uh, were in the ice. Uh, 005 here was, uh, there was no net there, and uh, the CEO mooring that was also just a CTD cast. Uh, so we were able to successfully deploy it at 11 stations. We sampled kind of a whole uh, suite of things for, you know, the typical oceanographic uh, cruise. We took water samples for a variety of purposes, including some uh, uh, HAP samples for Cassie Lefebvre and lots of other things. We sampled zooplankton vertically using a calvet and also uh, uh, opportunistically using a ring, drop, ring net for um, physiological experiments that we did on board. And then we had the surface and under ice trawl, which is actually equipped with two nets, a fish net about seven millimeter and a plankton, 300 micron plankton net. And then we had a midwater trawl. Unfortunately, we only got 
few sets with that because we ruined the net. Uh, it's not easy to sample in ice and that didn't work so well. The, uh, we also did get acoustic backscatter whenever possible and to give us some idea of what's in the underlying water column. That's particularly important because we couldn't use it all in most cases. And then we did some ice core sampling as well to get uh, phytoplankton in the ice. This is just a spot of the net um, of the uh, trawl uh, of the, you know, being deployed off an icebreaker. Um, there's a towing cable here. You can kind of vaguely see that here. And basically there's a heavy weight that's kind of on a, on a uh, block hanging off the towing cable here to keep the cable under the ice, to keep the cable down. And this net actually fishes to the side of the boat. It's designed to shear out to the side so the boat can go through the ice and you're not pulling the net right behind the boat, but to the side of the boat. Uh, it's also, besides the two nets that I talked about, it's instrumented with a, uh, you know, a bunch of instrumentation to look at the, uh, the ice, including measuring ice thickness and chlorophyll in the ice if possible. Uh, here's a picture of that of the Sekuliak. You can see how this shears out to the side. This is actually just before deploying the weight. You can see this, this is a one ton weight that's still on deck here. It's gonna be lowered down on a separate winch um, but is attached to the towing cable to basically pull the cable underwater. We did catch fish at all the stations that we sampled. Um, we caught a total of 170 fish, which was more than we had anticipated, more than we had hoped for, um, more than they sampled in the European Arctic. Um, just one little tidbit of, you know, some of the results. We haven't really um, analyzed the data yet. Uh, part of it is being held up by not being able to ship samples to Europe and other places at the moment. Um, but one thing that we found is that the catches of Arctic cod generally increased with sea ice thickness, uh, which is kind of what we were expecting that uh, you might see these fish come up under the ice as the ice thickens and may provide more shelter. Although all the ice that we sampled, um, and you can look at the video, I'll give you a link to that later, is pretty smooth underneath. So there aren't many places to hide under, but clearly they are associating, starting to associate with the ice, even uh, very thin ice of six to eight inches. Um, just a snapshot here uh, to show that we also collected a bunch of macro zooplankton, both in the surface and under ice trawl. Uh, lots of cleone and um, uh, amphipods that he was, would expect under the ice. And then also uh, the two methot trawls and with very contrasting catches in the open water versus uh, the trawl, the one trawl that we got in the ice before we ruined the net. Um, I'll end with just a couple surprises. Um, so there's, uh, we found this uh, Neomyces species, which is a coastal species really in pretty high densities over the basin that a few at a number of stations, um, both in the water column and under the ice, whether they just, you know, lost, uh, drifted out there. Um, we don't really know, but that was definitely a surprise. We also found three spine stickleback, which is a coastal fish species under the, uh, you know, basically over the slope regions. Again, they may just be uh, swept offshore and lost. And we found this amphipod, that's a benthic tube feeding amphipod um, uh, under the ice in, in you know, the basin in 2000 meters of water that had never been really reported under, uh, associated with ice. Um, uh, so that's really uh, all I have. I'll, uh, if you want to see a little more of how the ice works, um, there's a video and I put the link um, on the, uh, you know, I uploaded that in the, the, com the comments to, uh, with the, the copy of the presentation here. If you want to take a look at that, that should give you a better idea of how the net actually works. The net should, we should be able to deploy that off, um, you know, the Healy and other icebreakers and, um, uh, you know, hopefully we will get a chance to, to try that. And that's all I have. All right, Franz, excellent. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions right now? Will we change over the different talks? Hey, Franz, nice talk. Um, could you show the map of your stations again real quick? Uh, oops, yes. So we basically um, try to, uh, I gotta sh uh, share this again. 
So we try to um, uh, kind of do a zigzag pattern along the uh, along the slope, um, but you know that was obviously constrained by ice conditions by uh, by working with the Coda group. But we try to hit a station on the upper uh, the outer shelf, mid slope, and over the basin, and then do that repeatedly. Franz, this is Brendan. Could could you explain how the net was uh, steered off to the side so it went under the ice? I didn't quite follow how that worked. Uh, so this is, you see the picture? Yes. So this, the net's kind of unique in that it has a solid frame. It's a two by two frame. It's got a bridle on one side of the frame only. It's got these fat tires as bumpers basically. And it's got floats on top. So when you deploy this off the stern and uh, uh, you start steaming along, the water pressure just by pulling it through the water makes it shear out to the side. Um, so the water flows through the net um, and because it's, uh, you know, it's got a bridle attached to one side of the frame only, it shears out to the side. So we try to get, we try to get it away from the boat about 60 meters or so. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. That helps. Appreciate it. So, Franz, this is Kathy Kulitz. Yep. Hi. Um, so, I think we had a bird observer on that fall cruise. Is that correct? That was. Uh, yes, Brandon Smith was on that cruise and um, saw a bunch of birds. Yeah, I was wondering. I think you mentioned it once that there were what pigeon guillemots hanging around where there were a lot of Arctic cod. Could you show me what that was on your map? Um. That is a good question, and I don't know for certain where that was, but I believe it was one of these two here, uh, 21 or 22. Okay, um, I can look it up. I was just curious. Though. Yeah, so there was an open lead. There were lots of seals around. The ice had lots of seal holes in it. Um, so we knew there were Arctic cod around, and we did catch Arctic cod there. Thank you. Any other questions for Franz? Franz, okay. this is Danielle Dixon. Um, I'm just curious, I know three-spined three sicklebacks are a really interesting model species for genetic analyses. I'm curious if any of those fish that you caught were preserved for folks that work on that to, to use. We do have those, and honestly, I have to look up where they went. So we kept pretty much all the fish, um, uh, and they've been dissected and divvied up and uh, partitioned to various labs in various places. Um, we, it's certainly still possible perhaps to get genetic samples. I believe the sticklebacks, because that's not a species that we were interested in, actually went to Catherine Berjok for HAP analyses. Oh, sorry, not Catherine Berjok, okay. Catherine Lefebvre. <laughs> okay, maybe I can follow up with her and see if it's still possible to get anything useful from them. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any final question? Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, Franz, you could de-share or, and I'll share my screen. You off? Can you see that? Yep. Okay, great. So I'm gonna go ahead and give a brief update on the Subnautic Arctic Survey, the research programs, both for confirmed cruises in 2020 and plan for 2021. And um, I would just point out at the end of the slide, I'll give you the Zoom link for the uh, webinar that will occur on uh, Monday, March 20th. So basically, as a background, uh, we all know the fact about the sea ice changes that are going on linked to the atmospheric and ocean oceanographic components. We are seeing an accelerated opening of the Central Arctic Ocean for human, human use, such as transportation, potential fisheries, some of which uh, Franz was mentioning. Um, we see this over also in the Barents Sea, where the northward movement of uh, some of their species too. Uh, and also for the increase in uh, uh, military uh, use of the Arctic. 
And at the same time, we have potential for cascading to the ecosystem changes in the high Arctic, and especially as it connects with the girdling Arctic seas. So the SAS, the Synoptic Arctic Survey, it's a bottom-up research-driven initiative, and I'll give you a little bit of a timeline on that. Uh, the purpose being to define the present state of the Arctic Ocean and to look at the ongoing transformations, uh, emphasizing the water masses, ecosystem, and the carbon cycling. Uh, this is a pan-Arctic, uh, multi-ship, multidisciplinary study focusing on the August-September period. This is a recent article that came out, uh, Orvin Pasch uh, and others put together from, uh, and it came out in EOS last November and then the hard copy in January. Basically summarizing uh, the planning for this coordinated uh, pan-Arctic activity. The left is the, uh, uh, the Odin as well as the, uh, the Russian icebreaker going through the ice north of Greenland as an example of a photo, but on the upper right, what that purpose is, this is a pew graphic showing the uh, fishable depths to 2,000 meters. And so you can see the Chukchi borderland, uh, the Lomonosov Ridge, and other areas beyond the shelf systems that are, would be potential for fisheries if there was an expansion and commercial fishing was to occur. On the lower right was a, uh, just a look at what was observed uh, in the sea ice and also uh, future uh, CO2 flux is the top figure, so the bright bullet red as we uh, modeling for future CO2 in the lower right is the retraction of the sea ice and the future opening of the Central Arctic Ocean. So the SAS, as I mentioned, you can see some of the names has been more involved uh, since that time, multiple flags, multiple organizations that have been involved in the development and support of uh, the ongoing cruises for 2020 and plan for 2021 um, activities. So for the survey, is a present uh, to look at the state and ongoing transformations of the Arctic marine system. The purpose, as I've already mentioned, to compare uh, uh, current with potential for future state changes. The three foci of the SAS is to, are to look at the physical drivers and how they're important to the ecosystem and carbon cycle, cycling, to look at ecosystem response, and also at the carbon cycle and ocean acidification with the planning to have repeat uh, multi-ship operations on a decadal and in between on a national basis uh, uh, to look at these ongoing uh, changes as we move forward. So there are three core uh, areas that are in the international uh, science plan as well as the uh, workshop report that both of which I'll give you the links. And I believe I added them to the IARPIC website this morning to be able to see uh, where those uh, planning activities are going forward. I'm not gonna go through all of this that's on this figure, but the main things is the uh, physical response, the ecosystem response, and the carbon acidification. Under these three uh, areas, then there's three core questions, and underneath these, then there are action items and uh, going forward. For example, what are the changes in water mass sinking and transformation? And then on the other, uh, looking at the contribution of the global relation of the Arctic to the global ocean carbon dioxide uh, uh, levels. So if we go next, oh, one point I wanna bring out is one of the key parts of the SAS is to look at, to develop the training, the education and provide out, outreach activities. And this is because the next 10 years for myself, I'm probably not gonna be involved, although I might be guiding, uh, but there will be, uh, we have our early career scientists and mid-career scientists that will take on and do the synthesis on a lot of the results that are coming out of these multi-ship activities and moving forward. Briefly, uh, the timeline uh, started in 2014. This was the uh, beginning conceived at the Japan Norway Marine Science uh, Week that was held. Then we had our first workshop in Washington, DC, then a meeting in Russia. Uh, in 2017 was the beginning of drafting the science plan. You can see on the right the little uh, document there. Uh, 2018, and there were meetings in between. In 2018, there was a national meeting uh, in Japan, also another one in Norway. And you can see the updated plan that at the international level that's linked there for the Synoptic Arctic Survey. Then we began uh, developing the actual steering committee. We developed the U.S. steering committee that Karen Ashton, who's currently out on Mosaic, and myself are, are co-leading. Uh, and then we have members, I'll show you that a little later. 
We had uh, steering committee meetings at Woods Hole, information at AGU, and you can read the rest down the line, and submitted a planning uh, proposal to NSF. And uh, bringing this up in IARPIC uh, at various meetings uh, that you can look in the uh, archived presentations. I think Karen gave the previous one. So to highlight, we had a SAS open planning workshop last May at Woods Hole. And it was, uh, we were able to get support for the NSF from that, but also through the IASCA working groups for a cross-link uh, support for the early careers. So we had 59 participants, uh, 40 uh, from the US, 19 from abroad. We had a special emphasis on the early careers and you can see the numbers there. We had 17 participating from postdocs to graduate students. Uh, we also had uh, many of the International Science Steering Committee members. And then we also had uh, Carrie Erickson from uh, Uktiavik come to represent uh, and present some information on the indigenous community uh, activities. So we had 12 workshop goals. You can see them down. I'm not going to go through all of them there, but we did review the science questions and the science plan. We then brought up issues of data management, missing science topics, uh, adding elements for uh, uh, focused uh, studies. And then we uh, got to the point where we're looking at transects. And that report is available on the HUI SAS website that as I said at the final slide, you'll be able to see that link. What came out of that workshop and through our international discussions is the uh, a listing of essential ocean variables uh, within the SAS. I labeled this slide as relevancy to Arctic domain awareness because I gave a presentation at the Geospatial Agency and they were interested in activities, particularly in that red area there on the physical components of the opening of the Arctic that may have uh, uh, an influence and importance for both policy uh, and international activities. So we did submit a proposal, a, a baseline proposal for uh, to NSF that's under review now. We identified and added to these different uh, physical, biogeochemical, and ecosystem um, components there. Uh, that proposal, I would just say, if it's successful, would have a, half of the ship would be open. We requested the Healy and also some time on the Sekuliak if possible. But that would be open for other uh, scientists, national and international, through interagency collaboration to be involved and that information would come forward. There also is uh, many of this, the SAS would interface with the distributed biological uh, observatory activities, the ongoing ecofoci the Beaufort Gyre Environmental Observatory, this uh, CEO, the mooring, uh, and a lot of these shelf activities, including ones that I'm getting information on the Russian activities, as well as our Canadian and other uh, uh, communities of uh, the Pacific Arctic group that will be highlighted at both the SAS workshop and also the PAG meeting. Um, we have, have brought this up over time that this could be and continue to suggest it as a flagship activity of the, of the USIR pick. So this next slide shows the uh, field program, both the confirmed solid lines and proposed dash lines and the countries that are involved. And I'm gonna briefly just show you uh, the, uh, a couple, one slide from the, some of these countries, but the confirmed ones are Japan going out with the Mirai, Korea on the Iran. The Healy is obviously pending. The Zhulong is going to do the last pull off from Mosaic. And when on their return, they'll come across uh, the Arctic and start doing uh, some of the samplings on behalf of SAS. Uh, we have some uh, uh, discussions going on with uh, various, uh, the Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute, as well as the Shershoff in Russia. The confirmed one, core one to go out will be Sweden, uh, Odin. They've been planning this on the, for the uh, Eurasian side. Most of the other ones are on the, uh, uh, particularly our Asian and Canadian ones are on the, uh, the Amer Asian side. If you go around the circle clockwise, uh, Norway with their icebreaker and part of this uh, Nansen legacy, they're planning to extend that solid yellow, uh, red, oh gosh, orange line into the basin as a collaboration. Uh, and those are under continued discussions uh, for that in 2021, along with some uh, shelf activities. Um, you go around, the UK was planning and is currently in a, a pending situation. Canada, you can see there's different projects going on in the uh, Baffin Bay area, as well as in the north of their uh, Canadian archipelago. And then you come around at the 11 o'clock position and you can see the uh, 
the work being done by the uh, Beaufort Gyre Observing System, and then you swing back into the Pacific Arctic area. So just briefly, and I will go through the ODIN SAS, uh, and you can see that each one of these slides on the lower right has the courtesy, I asked people to put together one slide. This will be detailed more in the discussions at the SAS workshop. But this gives you where the ODIN is planning to go out. It'll be the August uh, into September period. You can see the, they have transect lines one through eight. It'll be north of Greenland and Canada up to the, uh, towards the North Pole. It, they'll be looking at sp spatial variation. And the figure you're seeing on the right there with the ice is what Pauline is saying. I mean, the, there's open water already north of Greenland in the, towards the Central Arctic Ocean as we speak. The second crew is the Japan. They're going to uh, we'll work with the uh, RV Mirai. This is from Shiga Nishido at a jam stack. Uh, their planning is to come across the shelf. They'll do some of the DBO lines. And they are in the blue that you're seeing there to come out. The yellow are the Korean lines, China coming back through uh, on the green lines and Canada. This is a schematic of the work on the BGO uh, activities. But their plans are listed here. Uh, they will be working, um, leaving Japan in, uh, on August and working in that area more into the September region. Time. The next one is uh, Kopri. This is the Korean plan for the SAS. They have uh, planned transect lines that have, uh, will also have moorings, and they will maintain those moorings into 2021. They will be looking at everything from physics, biology to chemistry. They're looking at uh, lower trophics, uh, bacteria, viruses, phytoplankton, zooplankton. Chemistry will look at PCO2, DIC, dissolved inorganic carbon, dissolved organic carbon, net community production, particular organic carbon. So they're interested in looking at the parameters. As I said at the beginning of the talk, there's a listing of the standard variables. And most of these are trying to figure out, incorporate as many of those uh, observing variables as they can in their studies. So this one particular water masses, they're looking at food web studies and chemical characteristics. For the uh, Canadian work, uh, Bill Williams brought this forward at our Pacific Arctic Group meeting in China last fall, and he will bring an update of this during our country report on uh, Sunday night. But this is the ongoing work up into the Canada Basin area and they uh, in their observing program looking at temperature, uh, salinity parameters, uh, nutrient oxygen, uh, also microplastics as well as plankton, and also some of the uh, radioisotope signals. Now this is something uh, Heidi Marie Cassens will speak about this further during the SAS meeting, but this is a moving, this is a new approved Arctic Century, it's called program. It's the international expedition to be on the academic Trishakov. And uh, it will be, uh, she just, you can see on the, over on the right there, uh, Nova Zemlia going out into the uh, Kara Sea there. And you can see the line she has on there. It's to mark the 100th anniversary. It's a uh, work between the Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute out of St. Petersburg in cooperation with the uh, GMR Alfred Wegener Institute and the Swedish Polish Institute. Swiss, Swiss. Swedish, ah, yeah, just on my mind. Um, the science program, you can read it. They're going to look at marine and terrestrial atmospheric cryospheric topics. And they want to, they're building cooperation and initiatives with the SAS, also T Mosaic, which is terrestrial mosaic, and also looking at the changing Arctic transpolar system cats. So this will be a 30 day expedition, and she'll spend, spend more time talking about it during our workshop. This is our proposed uh, US SAS cruise on the left, are some of the historic summer stations into the Canada Basin, and you can see the co different colors related to different cruises. And on the right are the proposed uh, stations uh, with both fast stations and slow process stations uh, indicated in the different colors uh, that you see in there, trying to bit higher resolution on the slope area. And um, that's about, Karen would be giving this part of the presentation, but she's sitting in the, on the, in Mosaic. Then uh, just to end up uh, the, the presentation, the International Steering Committee, you can see the list of representatives there. Uh, the chair is uh, uh, Arvind Pash, as I mentioned earlier. And we've had a meeting, a couple of meetings already on the US Steering Committee. This is the one on the right pictures when we were at Woods Hole. 
Uh, the U.S. Steering Committee is Karen Ashton and myself, Seth Danielson, uh, Mary Louise Timmermans, and Nick Bates, Lauren Jurenic, and Cindy. So at that point, I think I'm going to conclude and take any questions, but I would point out that the International Science Plan is on the top. This here, this one here is where the, you can get the Woods Hole uh, report uh, from last May. And I would like to point out that the virtual workshop uh, will be on the 30th, 12 uh, UTC time. Uh, and this is the Zoom link for that. But all that information and, and the abstract are now sitting on the ASSW website. So with that, I will take any questions. Hello. Hey, thanks. Um, this Franz. I, I was actually wondering from a fisheries perspective, the fiscal group, group in there, Sort of the plans for Central Arctic Ocean monitoring had strongly encouraged transects, including hydroacoustics. Do you know if all of these vessels and cruises will have hydroacoustic um, capability and will be sampling uh, uh, hydroacoustics along the way? Not all of them, Franz. You know, I know that the Odin has this, uh, other vessels, but we've been bringing that up to try to develop something where we could do that, put them on to talk about putting some of these on the other ships, but not every vessel is doing that, but we're trying to figure out a way that we can cooperatively get more of that type of measurement done on these vessels that are going into the basin. Some of them have the capabilities, others don't, but we particularly with the, uh, within the Pacific Arctic group, we've taken the Central Arctic Ocean and SAS as one of our core activities. So we're gonna hope to try to facilitate that through, science, through discussions and, um, that's a bad, we'll have more of that, and this is a good point to bring up for our, uh, and I will bring this up at our workshop on uh, Monday. Yeah, thanks. And also, it's key for, you know, it's fairly safe to assume that just about everything in the basin that we see is already caught, but uh, one key aspect of that would be to actually get some trawl samples as well to the extent possible. That's right, and that's why uh, Pauline was out on Mosaic. Uh, from, uh, and I, I'm not going to butcher her last name, but she's from Sweden. She was on Mosaic on leg one and tested a lot of different types of nets. And she will be presenting her, uh, some of those results during the SAS workshop. The idea being is that what, what could be used, and I think some of the nets are similar. I know you're, the net you have there, but how can we make sure that we have those uh, usable nets and usable acoustics on these vessels? Yep, thanks. Jackie, this is Danielle. I know at, at the SIS workshop in Woods Hole, um, there was discussion about the hope that the NSS would fund the core SIS proposal. It looks like that's planned to go ahead, hopefully for 2021. And that sampling, um, in addition to what was planned as the core to achieve things like Franz is suggesting, would hopefully then go in as separate proposals to NSF. Do you or just potentially any of the program managers from NSF who may be on the phone have any advice about um, when and how NSF would be uh, entertaining proposals like that? The silence is golden. Uh, I think a pro the program managers would be hard pressed to say anything except I know that it's out to review so the proposal. I would say that when we submitted, uh, it uh, included also having a request for shelf uh, ship to do the fisheries type work that would follow behind and go into the slope. Whether that is affordable, I'm not sure, whether it reviewed well, but that would be one part of it. But I think that with Bob Foy was very interested in the SAS and the fisheries activities. And so when he gives a, another talk, he he would be, I think the idea being is if we can convert, he's really pushing for the shelf to slope activities for the fisheries part of it. And so I think what's important if, if we go forward on this SAS, uh, well, we are going forward on it internationally, that there'd be this continued coordination and a planning uh, workshop. If we're successful, we'll go have a planning workshop in the fall. Uh, as far as the timeline, you know, if we are successful, and I don't think you can get anything more, I'm not going to put in a set, they won't say anything more than the fact that it's, it's out to review and there's panels. Uh, if it is, then it's opened up for half of the, you know, communities to apply, uh, to submit. 
but it also, a call would go out immediately as soon as we, you know, we'll just send out an open invitation to everybody that's on the list saying this is an opportunity uh, and go forward. Um, that, I think that's the most I could say. Uh, it, uh, probably things would have been faster if it didn't have the uh, COVID-19, but we'll just have to wait to see. And if anybody's in NSF on the line wants to say more, but I have a feeling they won't. Thank you, Jackie. Any other questions? I, I will say though, uh, you know, one thing is like, for example, for the, the Odin crews, I've been in contact with them, they develop uh, protocols. And that's one of the things we wanted to SAF to exchange those protocols. They are added, they weren't planning to do any benthic work. Now they're gonna have a uh, subsampling of some benthic work and they've managed to, to get a box core from Alfred Wegener Institute. So this, keeping the feedback loop of discussions going between the, um, the different cruise plans uh, would, you know, is an important thing to do as we go forward. Okay, any other questions? Hi, Jackie. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, since uh, Molly uh, McCammon asked the question, and I'm actually curious about it as well, um, how could the SAS be incorporated into the UN Decade uh, of the Ocean? Um, I, that's uh, certainly something that's on a lot of our minds and I'm not sure if you had any thoughts about it. I'm sure it's been discussed. Yeah, uh, thanks Dave. Uh, David, um, I think the part of it, you know, one thing is that re reality is there's no way we can launch a, a, an SAS every year and we recognize that, but every 10 years. And so it would fit in the results coming from 20 and 2021 could feed into a lot of mo synthesis and modeling and regional developments the regional reoccupation of some of those lines, that's my vision, that would be done under that decadal, a UN decadal uh, activity. And until this act, until everything was closed down, I was planning to go to that meeting in Copenhagen after the, I'm on the working group of integrated assessment of the Central Arctic Ocean, and we were having a meeting. Uh, this is the Pisces, Ices, and Pain uh, working group, but alas, so I don't have an update uh, for that, but those discussions were going to go on. They will now go on virtually. And we can, pro hopefully we'll be able to provide some update. I'm going to plant that seed into all the speakers for next Monday. Please, um, that, uh, I think we're all experiencing the, uh, the world of interrupted, uh, interrupted plans. So we'll have to adapt and figure out the, the, the best way forward uh, to try to sort some of, these, uh, some of these issues that still need to get sorted out. Correct. Okay, thanks. Thank yeah, you. David the, and Jackie, this is Molly. Um, another thought, I know the Ocean OBS group, um, which meets decadally as well, but they're talking now about not, not waiting for a decade and actually doing things on an annual basis and then maybe having another big meeting after five years. So maybe in the planning for the SAS, that's something to consider as well, like doing the 2021, then doing a five-year check-in and then having a big synthesis at the end of the, 10 year period too. Yeah, thanks Molly. And I would say that I didn't put up the slide, but we actually had a, a timeline of the meetings because we have these cruises going out, you know, this summer is to have, uh, if we're successful, the, have an open meeting in the fall that would have uh, international, but all the uh, US interested parties, SAS. And then we would have a planning meeting in the winter time of 2021 before we go out to sea in 2021. Uh, and then there would be a big synthesis after. so. But this timeline that you're presenting fits in well with some of the thought processes that have been going on and the discussions in the steering committee. Thanks. Good, and just one more, one more comment or question um, or, or thought, whatever, is um, how in the, the local EEZs, and I'm sure you thought about this with DBO, um, how additional maybe enhanced sampling could then, um, how, how we need to make sure that the, the data standards and the data collection methods are done so that they can be easily synthesized. And so I'm thinking of, of any other projects that are being done in the Bering, Chukchi, Beaufort, and ours in more local coastal that they also can dovetail or complement what's being done in the Central Arctic because certainly what's happening here could end up, I mean, it all, it's all connected, so. No, that's great. You know, and that's one thing at that, if you looked at that figure where I put in, it's in the, also in the Woods Hole report, we're developing shelf, shelf crew, trying to get a composite of shelf cruises. Like I know of four Russian cruises that are going out, they're shelf based. 
And so that, you know, trying to build that information like we do for the HAG BO, you know, just for the Pacific sector, but do a similar type thing for the SAS, but also for the shelf, because I know when we had that hour call with Bob Foy, he was really in, you know, the shelf and the shelf slope or where that fisheries, you know, they're the input. And so, for so yeah, the answer is yes. And I think for the Pacific Arctic group meeting, I'm trying to solicit some slides. And I know they're ones that were put together for the uh, uh, composites from like NOAA and the ones that NSF are doing. So we could all have one composite information. And I know you're gonna do this at your meeting in, eight, uh, in April. This is something that I was gonna put forward uh, to the group on, on, on uh, the, at the PAG meeting. But I know the input that I've been getting in on the shelf system, we need to know what everybody's doing. And you're right, can we have some standard measurements like we do with the DBO to make sure, and it's happening on some of the other cruises I know that are going out in the Pacific, but uh, knowing what they are uh, is an important way, the information transparency. And the data thing, yeah, we did talk about data at, at Woods Hole, and we did talk and have at other meetings too, and, and finding that, um, that sweet spot of how to do that. Na we, nationally, we have different archives we have to go to, but make them clear. And the other one is the international one. Right, great, thanks. Yep. Anybody else? Because I think we're running into uh, overtime, sorry. Um, and at this point, I think we've, we're kind of having an open discussion maybe for five more minutes. And then I think uh, we probably need to close it down if anybody wants to say anything uh, or add comments to the chat box. I'm, this is the time to do it. Otherwise, I'm going to turn this back over to Meredith. Does and anybody Jackie, have any statements? Yeah, Jackie, this is Kathy. Um, the workshop you're talking about Monday, is did, I missed that. Was that the PAG? Well, there's, there's two, Kathy. There's, uh, and there, the one for the synoptic survey is Monday at 12 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time, you know, UTC. So it's going to be, uh, and you can, if you look on the website for Arctic Science Summit Week, uh, you can see that time. The PAG, the Pacific Arctic Group meeting, is going to be at 0000 on the 30th, which is, happens to be 8 o'clock Eastern time on Sunday night. I will post both those meetings onto the IARPIC website information, but if you want to know them right away, and the Zoom addresses, you can go get that at the um, Arctic Science Summit Week uh, agenda you can download. Great. So yeah, I'd like to see those posted. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, the, the Zoom ones just came to, uh, today, uh, and I just got draft, updated draft agendas for both uh, PAG, because unfortunately my Chinese colleagues are, are not, re not responding. Uh, so I put this together, and uh, hopefully they will be back online for the PAG meeting, but Bill Williams will he'll be uh, taking that on uh, as, uh, well, I'm organizing it, I'll start it, and then he'll take it on as the upcoming chair in the fall. And that's gonna be, on Sunday night. So for the North Americans, it's Sunday night. For the Asians, it's Monday morning. And unfortunately for the Europeans, uh, it's middle of the night. But it's all gonna be recorded and it'll be posted on the ASSW site. Okay, great. Okay. Anything else? Going? Going? Okay, Meredith, back to you. Thanks, Jackie. Um, I. Just want to thank everyone for joining and we will post about the meeting Molly mentioned, the PI meeting in the bearing um, very soon. So stay tuned for that and stay tuned for more information about marine ecosystems meeting coming up next month as well. All right. With that, I'm going to thank everybody for joining in and sticking this out and be safe and be healthy. Thanks. Greg. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. You as well. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.